Okay, we are recording. Hi there, everybody. So I am doing um, this recorded lecture for um, chapter seven and chapter seven, we're talking about um, current assets, namely um, cash and receivables. And so we're gonna get practice um, determining uh, with our accounts receivables or notes receivables, the allowance for doubtful accounts and then um, also um, practice um, doing bank reconciliation, which I know we did a lot together in um, principles of accounting. So hopefully we remember how to do that. If not, we'll get a little um, refresher on it. So I am going to share my screen with you and get this PowerPoint pulled up. Okay, so hopefully we are seeing um, the intermediate accounting PowerPoint slides now. Um, <clears throat> so again, chapter seven, oh, hot dog. Chapter seven, we're getting into cash and receivables. Um, so we're looking at, you know, cash, what is considered cash, um, what is considered um, cash equivalents, and then receivable, how we recognize our accounts receivables, how we value accounts receivables. Um, same thing with notes receivable, uh, recognition and valuation of notes receivable. And then a few of the special um, issues associated with these assets. So the fair value option, um, disposition or getting rid of uh, accounts, notes receivable, disposing of, if you will, and then um, presentation and analysis. So um, cash and cash equivalents, you know, again, we, we've touched on this before. Um, you know, basically cash and cash equivalents are, um, you know, anything that is easily converted to cash. Um, uh, so, you know, if we think about cash being our most liquid assets, things like coins, currency, um, available funds at the bank, money orders, certified checks, cashier's checks, um, personal checks, bank drafts, savings accounts, right, are considered cash. Um, cash equivalents, again, uh, short-term investments um, that are easily converted to cash or very near their maturity where there is no risk of, of change in value. So they're showing us some examples here, treasury bills, um, commercial paper, money market funds, um, things like that. And so it shows us on um, this slide how we report um, these items. Uh, so cash, um, obviously reported as cash, petty cash and change funds also reported as cash, um, short-term paper. Again, these are investments with maturity of less than three months, cash equivalents. Um, Post-dated checks and IOUs are considered receivables or money we expect to receive. Um, travel advances are either considered receivables or prepaid expenses, um, depending on how the company uh, records them. Um, postage on hand is a prepaid expense. Bank overdrafts, um, when we write a check and we don't have the money in the bank to cover it, that's an overdraft, that's a liability. And then compensating um, balances, these are um, cash that is kept aside or separately classified um, and, and maintained as a compensating balance. So, um, you know, as we read in this chapter, as it tells us in this chapter, you know, we could have loan terms where we have to keep X amount of money in the bank. So, you know, if we take out a loan, one of the terms of the loan could be, you know, you have to keep, you know, for example, $100,000 in the bank as a compensating balance. Um, so, you know, our book also talks about those, but those just kind of show us how we report uh, some of these items. And so receivables, you know, we've heard a lot about accounts receivables. We've also talked about notes receivables. And when we've talked about the difference between accounts receivables, notes receivables, is that um, ac accounts receivables, these arise from providing products and services to customers. Um, these are also known as trade receivables, right? So accounts receivables, trade receivables, same thing. Um, they are receivables that arise from the sale of goods or services, right? 
Um, whereas a note receivable usually has a more formal agreement, a more formal contractual agreement attached to it. Um, so it's a written promise to pay a certain amount of money at a, at a future or specified date in time, right? And so non-trade receivables, um, these could be things like advances to um, or loans to officers or employees, um, advances to subsidiary companies, um, deposits paid to cover potential damages or losses, deposits paid as a guarantee of performance or payment or dividend and interest um, receivable. You know, non-trade receivables, we kind of would lump those together in a, in a group called other receivables, right? All right, so the recognition of accounts receivables. So, um, you know, again, accounts receivables generally arise from um, the, the sale of goods or, or services. Um, and we have to follow that revenue recognition principle that states that revenue has to be recorded um, when it's earned rather than when the cash is paid. And so this is why we have that accounts receivable account, right? If the customer doesn't pay cash, then we debit accounts receivable credit revenue. Um, and so a few things that we have to keep in mind when determining or valuing our accounts receivables um, is if um, there is any return, sale return um, or allowance, any rebate given or discount given. Um, and then um, also we have to think about uh, uncollectible accounts or bad debt expense, which we'll talk about more as we go through uh, the remainder of the PowerPoints. All right, so trade discounts um, and then cash discounts. We talked about both of these and, and actually got practice with both of these um, in principles of accounting. But again, we're gonna briefly touch on each of them. Um, and, and in fact, in principles of accounting, as it relates to cash discounts or sales discounts, we practice the gross method is, is what we learned in principles of accounting. But anyway, we'll see the difference between those two methods. So remember trade discounts, we don't have to do anything to record a trade discount. Basically a trade discount is just the amount given off the invoice cost. So, you know, just to make the math easy on me, if we have, um, you know, a hundred dollar sale and we're giving the customers a 40% trade discount, then we're gonna sell it to them for $60. So we don't need to record a trade discount at all, right? It's just a reduction from the list, list price. Uh, there is no journal entry to record it. It's not recognized in the accounting records. We basically would just bill our customers for the amount less um, the trade discount. So we don't have to record um, trade discounts in any way. Uh, cash discounts or sales discounts though um, do have to be recorded. And so hopefully we remember these terms, um, two slash 10 in slash 30, 2 slash 10 EOM, which means end of month, or net 30 end of month. Remember that 2 slash 10 means, you know, 2% off if paid within 10 days or the net amount is due in 30, or 2% um, off if paid within uh, within 10 days or the, the entire amount is due end of month, right? So hopefully we remember those. And then again, the gross method versus the net method. So you'll see here on the, the gross method is what we've gotten practice with before, um, but we'll just kind of compare um, the differences. So the sale of $10,000 uh, terms 2 slash 10 in slash 30, again, 2% off if paid within 10 days or the net amount is due in 30. So under the gross method, we record this sale. Um, and, and again, this is what we have gotten practice with before is we debit accounts receivable, we credit revenue, right? Under the net method, however, we would take that 2% discount off the top, essentially. So then we would be debiting accounts receivable for only 9,800. Again, because we took that 2% discount uh, off the top of it. And then we're crediting revenue for 9,800. 
a uh, payment of 4,000 of sales received within the discount period. So if the customer makes a $4,000 payment within that discount period, then we're going to give them 2% um, off of that amount, right? So they make that, that $4,000 payment, we give them 2% off, which means we're gonna bring in actual cash, uh, 3,920. The sales discount is 80, and then we credit accounts receivable for the entire 4,000. Whereas again, with the net method, it's a little bit different. Um, we don't use that sales discount uh, account. Um, we would debit cash credit accounts receivable. And then the additional $6,000 um, payment on the $6,000 of sales received after the discount period. So then it would just be a, a debit to cash, credit to accounts receivable under the gross method, which again is what's used more often, what we practiced um, in principles of accounting. But the net method, um, since, this, since this payment, this last payment was received after the discount period, there is no... Um, there is no discount given off of that, right? So then uh, they did take advantage of the $80 discount, but we have to do an adjustment for the sales discount forfeited, the other uh, $120, right? So then we are debiting accounts receivable, increasing accounts receivable, because we initially debited AR for 9,800. Um, but since they have forfeited part of this discount um, or not taken part of this discount now, we're debiting accounts receivable for 120. So that took up the total amount they owed us then, you know, assuming from the beginning of the sale up to $9,920, right? And then um, crediting sales discounts forfeited, 120, debiting cash, 6,000, crediting accounts receivable, 6,000. So, you know, the gross methods used more often, um, that's kind of what we focus on definitely in principles of using, um, but the net method is also there and available for companies to use. Although I think the gross method, um, like your book tells us is used more often. All right, so sales returns and allowances, you know, again, in principles of accounting, we got practice with this sales returns and allowances account. Um, what is new to us is this allowance for sales returns and allowances. So sales returns and allowances is a contra revenue, which means it's opposite to the revenue account, right? So it's a, a contra revenue account to um, sales revenue. And so when we're calculating total revenue um, or, or um, net sales, I guess we could say, when we're calculating net sales, we take our total revenue less any sales returns and allowances or minus any sales returns and allowances, and that gives us net sales, right? So it's a, a contra revenue account. We subtract it from our revenue. Um, the allowance for sales returns and allowances is a contra asset account to accounts receivable. So that one, um, if we have our allowance for sales returns and allowances, it is opposite to the AR account. So we use that in calculating um, net realizable value. So here's our example of this. It says, Max Glass sells $5,000 of hurricane glass to Oliver Builders on account. Max Glass estimates that 400 of these glass sales will either be returned or an allowance will be granted. Max Glass records the sale on account and records an allowance for the sales returns and allowances as follows. So we debit accounts receivable, credit sales revenue, but then we also debit sales returns and allowances and credit the allowance for sales returns and allowances. So um, I'll be honest with you guys in the in the positions that I've held, um, you know, the different accounting positions that I've held, I have never used this allowance for sales returns and allowances account. <laughs> um, so we do uh, use a um, 
allowance for doubtful accounts and and that's like the bad debt expense i've used that one before that's generally accepted uh accounting principle um but i've never used this allowance for sales returns and allowances um so anyway we'll we'll get practice with it we definitely use this one though right and we've gotten practice with this one um in in principles of accounting as well so if we're thinking about um you know sales revenue uh 500,000 or uh, excuse me 5,000 um minus sales returns and allowances 400 that would be net sales of 4600 right the difference between those two all right so um receivables as we saw back at the beginning of the powerpoint kind of the issue with um accounts receivable notes receivable is um you know how these are classified and then how they're valued right so that's kind of the the two issues with each of them how do we classify them how do we value them so um classification is determined by whether it's a short term or a long term um so it, uh, classification involves determining the length of time each receivable will be outstanding Again, if we expect to receive that money within 12 months, that's short term. If it's going to take longer than 12 months or longer than a year, that's long term, right? Um, and then we value and report short term receivables at net realizable value. And remember that net realizable value, that is accounts receivable minus the allowance for doubtful accounts minus the allowance for sales returns and allowances is how we get that net realizable value what we actually expect to collect or we expect to realize from our accounts receivable all right so uncollectible accounts receivable um you know this is where we're we're calculating bad debt expense um it, as it shows here it can also be called uncollectible accounts expense but normally we use bad debt expense and you know this is just uh you know kind of a harsh reality of business is that you know not all customers pay their bill right not all customers are going to pay their bill so you know, by ex extending credit to customers, um, we are accepting risk or we are increasing our risk, uh, risk of not being able to collect that money, right? Because that's just kind of a harsh reality of, of business is that not all customers are going to pay their bill, right? So um, there are two main methods that we use for um, calculating bad debt expense. Um, the direct write-off method and the allowance method. So as we're going to see, the direct write-off method is not GAAP. It is not the generally accepted accounting principle. So publicly traded companies have to use the allowance method, right? All right, so just as it shows here, the direct write-off method, again, there is no matching because we're not matching bad debt in the period the revenue was earned, right? Um, we're not usually writing off the account in the period that the revenue was earned, right? So um, also with the direct write-off method, we're not showing receivables at their net realizable value. So, you know, again, that goes against uh, the, the generally accepted accounting principle. And so again, the direct write-off method is not GAAP. It's not generally accepted uh, accounting principle. The allowance method, however, is and, and basically what we do with the allowance method, we're going to get practice with this together. But at the end of the period, at the end of the year, for example, um, we calculate an allowance. And, and again, that allowance is based on previous data or based on prior years, what was uncollectible or what we had for bad debt in prior years. Right. So at the end of the year, we calculate the allowance and then as we're going through the next year um, and we're and we have to write off accounts it's getting wrote uh it's getting wrote off or written off from um, not only the allowance account but then accounts receivable as well so again we'll see um, we'll see examples of this in the powerpoint and, and get practice with it um, there's a couple different ways that we can calculate um, the allowance or the the bad debt expense 
And that's by either using a percentage of sales or a percentage of receivables. So again, we'll, we'll get practice with it together um, both ways. All right, so here's our first example. It says, assume that Brown Furniture in 2017, its first year of operations, has credit sales of 1,800,000. Of this amount, 150,000 remains uncollected at December 31. The credit manager estimates that 10,000 of these sales will be uncollectible. The adjusting entry to record the estimated uncollectible. So we see here, we debit bad debt expense credit the allowance for doubtful accounts. And again, we do this at the end of the year. Um, and so the following year, as we are writing off accounts, um, we debit the allowance credit uh, account receivable is, is how that works. And here's an example of that. Um, so it says, the financial vice president of Brown Furniture authorizes a write-off of the $1,000 balance owed by Randall Company on March 1. The entry to record the write-off is, so again, we're debiting. So when we estimated the allowance, remember if we go back here, when we estimated, hot dog, when we estimated the bad debt expense, we debited bad debt expense, we credited the allowance for doubtful accounts. Now that we're writing off an account, we're, we're debiting the allowance for doubtful accounts, crediting accounts receivable, right? And then this one says, um, assume that on July 1, Randall Company pays the $1,000 amount that Brown had, had uh, written off in March. Here are the entries. So when the customer makes a payment to the account that has already been written off, what we have to do is we have to reinstate the bad debt. And so that's what we're seeing here. We have to reinstate the account, reinstate the debt. So when we wrote it off, we debited allowance for doubtful accounts, we credited AR, but, but now we do a reversing entry. We do the opposite to reinstate the debt. So to reinstate the debt, we debit accounts receivable, credit allowance for doubtful accounts, and then we record the payment, debit, cash, credit, accounts receivable. Again, we'll get practice um, with this together in class. You guys have a multiple choice question, if I'm remembering correctly on the exam, where you need to know what these two um, journal entries look like. All right, so this shows you how um, how the net realizable value uh, is shown on the accounts receivable. So if we have, you know, accounts receivable of, uh, of 150,000, but we think that 10,000 is going to be uncollectible, that gives us a net realizable value of 140,000, right? So net realizable value is the amount that we expect to collect from our accounts receivables. All right, so um, determining that um, bad debt or that allowance, you know, what we're going to use for our allowance for doubtful accounts, um, we can do that by, you know, calculating a percentage of sales. We can do that by calculating a percentage of receivables, or we can do it by calculating um, the amount based on an aging schedule. So if we do um, percentage of sales or if we do percentage of receivables, we're just using one rate, one composite rate. And we're taking the, the dollar amount times that rate, right? But if we're looking at an aging schedule, which I think the next slide shows us, if we're looking at an aging schedule, um, we use different rates because um, and I actually, I have a copy of an aging schedule, so I need to re remember to put it in my bag so I can show it to you guys um, when we meet in class again next. But um, the aging schedule basically divides up all of our accounts receivables into their age groups. So usually we'll have like a zero to 30 days and a 31 to 60 days and a 61 to 90 days type thing, right? Um, and the older an account gets, the higher the bad debt percentage, um, because the older an account gets, the harder it is to collect on it. And so we see this here, and let me blow this up a little bit. Um, and so we're looking here, if we've got um, 
an account that's under 30 days old, we have 345,000 in there and we expect only 0.8%, so less than 1%, right? 0.8% to be uncollectible. But now when we get into the 30 to 60 days old, we expect 4% of those to be uncollectible. When we get into the 61 to 90 days old, we expect 15% um, of those to be uncollectible. When we get into the 91 to 120 day old accounts, we expect 20% to be uncollectible. And then again, in the over 120 days, we expect 25% uh, to be uncollectible. Because again, the reality is, is that the older an account gets, the less likely we are to collect on it, the more likely we are to have to write it off, right? So um, at the company, I think I've mentioned this before to you guys, but at the company that I worked for, um, collections was part of my job duty. So I was looking at this aging schedule every week, right? At, at least once a week, I was looking at the aging schedule and I was trying to, you know, obviously collect on really old accounts, but then also, you know, staying on top of the ones that just switched to overdue. Um, at the company I work for, we had a standard kind of do um, uh, credit terms of 60 days. So we didn't even start calling and trying to collect on the account until it was at least 60 days old. So, you know, me, I was, you know, as soon as it hit 61 days old, I was sending out a new invoice or emailing a new invoice. However, we usually sent uh, the customer invoices. So um, I tried to stay on top of them. And I really, I took it, which, you know, I'm again, I'm a, like, I'm a big accounting nerd. So like, I got excited when I was able to like collect on old accounts, you know, like I kind of, I, I took it personal a, a little bit, just like, you know, it made me real excited when I, when I collected on an old account or when I, I got an old invoice, you know, got them to pay it type thing. Right. I also would get excited when we had, um, when we would have a big um, envelope, you know, my, the envelope, our, our customers' payments, the accounts receivable payments would come in. And the thicker the envelope was, the more payments were in it, you know, so I'd get really excited when it was a thick envelope. So, um, you know, it would, the, the joys of being an accountant, right? But anyway, um, so now this shows us, ooh, hot dog, let me go back. Um, this one shows us if we're using a percentage of accounts receivable, um, we have to think about what's already in the allowance for doubtful accounts. And, and when we do this together on the board, I think it'll be easier when we have it like in T account form and we're looking at it that way, but we can get an idea anyway here. It says um, Duke and Company reports the following financial information before adjustments. So we've got uh, accounts receivables of 100,000, allowance for doubtful accounts of 2,000. Um, so our net realizable value at this point is what? 98,000, right? 100,000 minus 2,000, net realizable value, 98,000. And then we've got uh, sales revenue, 900,000, sales returns and allowances, 50,000. So then at this point, we'd have net sales of what? 900,000 minus 50,000. Net sales would be 850,000 if, if we were calculating net sales at that point. But so it says, prepare the journal entry to record bad debt expense, assuming Duncan Company estimates bad debt at 5% um, of accounts receivable. So we're taking our um, 100,000 times 5%. Right, hundred thousand times five percent that equals five thousand. So we want and an allowance for doubtful accounts has a normal credit balance, right? So we want the allowance for doubtful accounts to be a credit balance of five thousand. It already has two in there, so we need to do our adjusting entry for three thousand. So again, debit, bad debt, expense, credit, allowance for doubtful accounts. All right, notes receivable, again, the difference in accounts receivable, notes receivable is that notes receivable usually have a more formal contractual uh, agreement associated with it, a promissory note, um, if you will. And I, 
you know, I don't, I don't know if William Woods does promissory notes for people that get tuition reimbursement. Um, so I can't, I can't speak for William Woods. That's maybe something I need to call the billing office and ask them, but I know at Lindenwood, um, because I used to work in Lindenwood's accounting department um, for several years. At, at Lindenwood, Lindenwood offered promissory notes to students that got tuition reimbursement. So the way that tuition reimbursement, like from their work or from a job, for example. So the way tuition reimbursement usually works is that once you finish the class, you know, you fill out, a, you know, whatever, a piece of paper at your work and you give them a copy of the, you know, like the class you took, the name of the course, and then how much it cost. And you turn that in for tuition reimbursement. And so usually, um, you know, you get paid from your company, you know, within a month of the class ending. Um, and so Lindenwood would offer students promissory notes and the promissory note would give them until a month after the semester ended to pay that bill. And this kept for students that got tuition reimbursements from their companies. And we saw this a lot more, especially with like students working on their master's degrees or um, doctorate degrees, right? That were already out there in the workforce. Um, uh, Lindenwood would do this so that these students did not have to take out student loans. Since their company was paying for it, um, you know, Lindenwood didn't want the students to have to take out student loans. So then they would just give them that promissory note. And that promissory note is, again, a promise to pay a certain amount of money at a future specified date. So, you know, again, just to make the math easy on me, say that um, Lindenwood charges $500 a credit hour and it's a three credit hour course. So then the student is going to have to pay $1,500 for that course, right? So then the student would sign a promissory note saying, you know, I agree to pay $1,500, you know, by, uh, you know, one month after the end of the semester. Um, and that would be a, a zero interest promissory note. Lindenwood did not charge students interest on that. And again, it helped out students because they they didn't have to take out student loans then, right? So um, like it shows here, we uh, businesses can also issue promissory notes or let, you know, let their customers sign promissory notes um, to extend payment for an outstanding receivable. Um, for high risk or new customers, loans to employees or subsidiaries, um, sales of PPE, uh, property, plant, and equipment, and lending transactions. Okay, so then when we talk about notes, again, valuation, are they short-term, are they long-term um, notes, interest-bearing or zero interest-bearing, and we're going to look at examples of each of these different um, different variations. Uh, Short-term notes are reported at their net realizable value. Um, same thing as um, accounts receivable, right? Long-term notes, um, just like it shows here, FASB requires companies to disclose not only their cost, but also their fair value in the notes to the financial statements. Interest-bearing notes has a stated um, rate of interest. Um, so it's, you know, explicitly stated, you know, 10% interest or 6% interest or whatever the case may be. Zero interest bearing notes um, do not have an interest rate specifically stated. You know, basically um, a zero interest bearing note might be like, okay, um, I'm going to give you $8,000 right now and you have to pay me back in six months $10,000. So that 2000 is is the interest, but there's not an interest rate um, explicitly stated in in the, the note, if that makes sense. Anyway, we're going to get get practice with them. And so like we see here, um, we can have and, and we also run into this with bonds as well. And so we'll talk about this more with with bonds. Um, but we, we can have a, a face value note, a premium note, a discount uh, note. And so when the stated rate of the note is equal to the market rate, that's a face value or par value note. 
um, when we have a stated rate that is greater than the market rate, um, that's a premium. And when the stated rate is less than the market rate, um, that's a discount. And so again, we'll see examples um, of each of these. And so here's our first, it says Bigelow Corporation lends Scandinavian imports um, 10,000 in exchange for a $10,000 three-year note, bearing interest at 10% annually. The market rate of interest for a note of similar risk is also 10%. So this is a face value note or par value note. How does Bigelow record the receipt of the note? So, you know, essentially um, we're lending like if we're Bigelow, if we're Bigelow, we're lending Scandinavian imports $10,000 and they're going to pay us back $10,000 in three years and they're going to pay 10% interest annually on that. Um, so if we're thinking about that, you know, again, um, we're, we're giving them the $10,000 loan and they have to pay us back the ten thousand dollars plus ten percent interest, right? Is 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 how um, this works. And so we're going to see, and and we did see this a, a little bit in chapter six, and we're going to revisit our um, present value tables um, in in chapter seven as well, because how we would record this is. Um, we look at the present value of the interest, the present value of the principal, right? And, and this is a par value or face value note. So present value is $10,000, right? And so when we issue the note or we take, um, accept the note, we debit notes receivables, we credit cash, right? Because we are lending them cash in exchange for this note, right? And, so, and, and you could think of it like an IOU, you know, we're, we're lending this company cash and they're giving us an IOU basically, right? Um, so we're debiting notes receivable, crediting cash. And then at the end of the first year, um, when they make their first interest payment, we are debiting cash, crediting um, interest revenue. All right, zero interest bearing note. Um, this one says Jeremiah Company receives a three year $10,000 zero interest bearing note. The market rate of interest for a note of similar risk is 9%. How does Jeremiah record the receipt of the note? So we wanna go to our um, present value of one table. This is table six two page 316 and 317. And we want to look at, you know, again, um, this is three years. So we want the three period row, the 9% column. And so if we go to three periods, 9%, that's a factor of 0.77218. And so we would take our um, $10,000 times that factor, uh, 0.77218. And so on this note, basically we're gonna give them cash, $7,721.80. And when they pay us back, they're gonna have to pay us back the entire $10,000. So the discount on the notes receivable is really the interest that the customer is going to pay us, right? Or the interest that um, the lendee is going to pay us, right? Um, and so we see too on this uh, amortization schedule. So we start with the carrying value of the note. This is how much cash we paid for this. So $7,721.80. And then every year we have to recognize a little bit of this as interest revenue, right? Because this is what this represents, the interest on this loan. So every year we have to recognize a little bit of this interest revenue. And so we see here, remember a, a note of similar risk um, pays 9% interest. So if we take our carrying amount times 0 0.09, we're gonna recognize interest of $694.96 um, the first year. 
And so then we add that interest revenue to the carrying amount. So now we're up to 8416. So now we're going to take 8416 times 0 0.09 and that's how we get 757.51. And so we're going to recognize that interest revenue um, that takes our carrying value up. And then finally, we take $9,174 times 9%. That's where we get um, $825.73. Um, and, and that's the interest revenue that we recognize the third year. Um, and, and so every year, you know, when we originally accept this note, again, we debit notes receivable. Um, we credit the discount on notes receivable. We credit cash. And then every year as we're amortizing um, this loan, we would debit the discount credit interest revenue. Debit the discount credit interest revenue. Oh, and so that's what it's showing us here again for that first year. Debit the discount credit interest revenue. All right, interest bearing note uh, example. This one says Morgan Corporation makes a loan to Marie Company and receives in exchange a three year $10,000 note bearing interest at 10% annually. The market rate of interest for a note of similar risk is 12%. Prepare the journal entry to record the receipt of the note. All right, so in this case, again, we want to calculate the present value of the principal. And so that is um, present value of one. And then we want um, present value of the interest. Um, and this is present value of annuity, right? And so we calculate the present value of the note. Um, the difference between the present value and the face value is, is the difference, that's the discount. So then we see our journal entry for that would be, again, debit to notes receivable, credit to the discount on notes receivable, um, credit to cash. So, you know, we, we basically be giving them cash of $9,520 and they'd have to pay us back 10,000. The difference between those is the amount of interest. And so on this particular, um, on this particular note, we're gonna have interest of $480, interest revenue, right? And so it shows that here um, on uh, this example. And so again, we're taking this um, $9,520 times the 12% interest, um, and that's 1,142. And so, we receive, because again, they're paying us 10% interest per year, right? On, on this $10,000 loan. So um, $10,000 times 10%, $1,000. So they're paying us $1,000 interest, but we're amortizing part of that $480 um, discount. So we're going to claim interest revenue, $1,142. And so if we add, um, you know, 95 20 plus 1,142. Now we're up to a carrying value of 9,662. Um, you know, the next year, if we take our um, 9,662 times 0.12 or times 12%, right? Um, then the next year they pay us a thousand, but we're actually going to claim interest revenue of one thousand one hundred and fifty nine because we're amortizing part of that discount um, or that interest off off of the top, right? So um, when we do that every year, we would um, debit just like it shows here. Well, in this case too, the customer's paying that thousand dollar cash interest, so. We're debiting cash, debiting the discount, crediting interest revenue. All right, so some of those special issues. Um, so fair value options, companies have the option to use fair value as the basis of measurement um, in, in our financial statements for um, some of these assets. 
and they can elect the fair value option either when the financial instrument is or originally recognized or when some kind of event triggers a new basis of accounting. Um, and so if companies choose the fair value option, then receivables are recorded at fair value. And then we'd have to calculate um, unrealized holding gains or losses um, as part of other comprehensive income, right? Um, part, part of net income, it's considered other comprehensive income. So um, company reports the receivable at fair value each reporting date. And so, you know, if we have a gain on the fair value, then we would um, credit unrealized holding gains or losses. If we have a loss, uh, or it goes down in value over the period, then we would debit unrealized holding gains or losses. And so here's an example of that. It says, Escobar Company has notes receivables that have a fair value of 810,000 and a carrying amount of 620,000. So they're on our books right now at 620,000 or they're on the books of somebody right now uh, at 620,000, that's the carrying value, but they're actually worth 810,000. So Escobar decides on December 31st of the current year to use the fair value option for these receivables. This is the first valuation of these recently acquired receivables. At December 31, Escobar makes an adjusting entry to record the increase in value of notes receivables and to record the unrealized holding gains or losses. So again, we wanna take it from a, a book value of 620 up to 810. So we're debiting notes receivable, crediting unrealized holding gain or loss. And, and in this case, a gain, right? It's going from 620 to 810. So that's why we're crediting. If it was going down in value, then we'd be doing the opposite. We would debit unrealized holding gain or loss. We would um, credit um, notes receivable. All right, disposition or disposing of uh, accounts receivables or notes receivables. Um, sometimes this is called factoring. Um, if we sell our receivables, um, we're factoring our, our receivables. And so, um, you know, companies can do this for several reasons. Maybe they want to raise a large amount of cash, so they sell their accounts receivables. Maybe they do not want to have an in-house collections person or an in-house collections department. So then they, they basically outsource that to a different company. Um, so, so they just sell their receivables to a different company. Um, and, you know, it's usually companies do this and, and, and then they can also pledge their receivables as well um, as like collateral for a loan, for example. So, that's what it means here by secured borrowing. So, you know, we could take out a loan, for example, if we're a company, we could take out a loan and, you know, we, we can say like, you know, as collateral, you know, we'll sign off, you know, 200,000 of our accounts receivable. So if we don't pay the loan, then the lender has the right to basically collect on those accounts receivables um, instead of us getting the money. And then sale of receivables, again, this is sometimes referred to as factoring, uh, you know, we're selling our accounts receivables, whether it's to, you know, a company that, um, you know, does accounts receivable collection as their main business. Um, or even if we think about when accounts get really old, we can sell them to a collection agency. Um, usually the collection agency only pays like pennies on the dollar for each um, for each receivable or, or, or factors have some percentage fee that they charge um, nonetheless. So um, sale without recourse or sale with recourse. So um, sale without rec recourse, like, you know, basically if we're selling our accounts receivables and we're saying, hey, you know, once we sell these to you, they are your responsibility. You have the responsibility um, to collect on these. We have nothing more to do with it. That's without recourse, right? So the purchaser assumes risk of collection. 
Um, the transfer is an outright sale of the receivable. The seller records loss on sale. So maybe we have, you know, 300,000 in accounts receivables. We're going to sell them for 250,000. We have to record that $50,000 loss on the sale. A sale with recourse basically says, hey, you know, our you know, our customers pay, you know, all the time, you know, we have a, a high percentage of customers that pay. And so we feel really good about you being able to collect on all these accounts receivables that will basically give you a guarantee is what it is, right? A sale with recourse, the seller guarantees payment to the purchaser. So if the customer doesn't pay the accounts receivable or the notes receivable, then the seller has some type of guarantee on it as well. All right, so here's our example of that. It says, Crest Textiles Inc. factors 500,000 of accounts receivable with Commercial Factors Inc. on a without recourse basis. Um, commercial Factors assesses a finance charge of 3% of the amount of accounts receivables and retains an amount equal to 5% of the accounts receivable for probable adjustment. Crest Textile and Commercial Factors make the following journal entries for the receivables transferred without recourse. So um, Crest Textiles then um, is selling their accounts receivables to Commercial Factors, right? So Crest Textiles is going to debit cash because they're selling their accounts receivables, um, debit the amount still due, from the factor from commercial factors, debit a loss on the sale of receivables, um, credit uh, accounts receivables for the 500,000. Commercial factors on the other hand is now assuming this 500,000 of receivables. Um, they have a liability here due to customer for 25,000, you know, if they're able to collect on all of them, uh, they'll still owe another 25,000 then to Crest Textiles. Um, the loss over here for 15,000 to Crest is the interest revenue for commercial factors. And then of course the um, credit to cash for the amount of cash being paid for these. All right, sale of receivables with recourse. Again, that with recourse is, is basically a guarantee um, or, or a liability that the seller is creating, um, a liability or a guarantee that the seller is giving. And so this one says, assume Crest Textiles sold the receivables on a with recourse basis. Crest Textiles determines that this recourse obligation has a fair value of 6,000. To determine the loss on the sale of receivables, Crest Textiles computes the net proceeds uh, from the sale as follows. So um, cash received 460,000, still due from factor um, 25,000. Uh, that gives us 485,000 less the recourse liability and so um, the net proceeds from this sale, 479,000. And so if we take that book value of the receivables, 500,000, less the net proceeds, 479,000, that gives us a loss on the receivables of 21,000. So, you know, to compare this with the without recourse, remember the loss without recourse, if we go back, the loss without recourse was 15,000, right? But when we're giving an additional guarantee or we're creating this additional liability, then we claim the loss of 21 instead of uh, 15. Okay. Secured borrowing, um, this is, I mentioned earlier, sometimes companies can pledge their accounts receivables um, as part of a loan. So this one says on April 1st, 2017, Rashid Company assigns 400,000 of its accounts receivables to the Third National Bank as collateral for a $200,000 loan due July 1st, 2017. The assignment agreement um, calls for Rashid to continue to collect the receivables. 
third national bank assesses a finance charge of 2% of the accounts receivables and interest on the loan is 10%. So our instructions are to prepare the journal entry for Rashid company. And so this is when it takes out the loan. Um, prepare the journal entry for the collection of accounts receivables and then prepare the journal entry when Rashid pays the entitled, uh, the total amount due um, to Third National Bank. And so uh, the April 1 entry here um, for Rashid Company, you know, again, they're taking out a loan for 200000 but um, Third National Bank charges a 2% fee. So instead of getting $200,000 in cash, they're only going to get cash of $192,000 because they have a 2% finance charge. So we're going to debit cash, debit the finance charge, or what we could also really call interest expense if we wanted, um, debit the interest expense, credit notes payable for $200,000. And then B, prepare the journal entry for Rashid's collection of 350,000 in accounts receivables. That just looks like any other time we collect on accounts receivables, we debit cash, credit uh, accounts receivable. And then on July um, 1st, when we pay back this loan, um, you know, we're debiting notes payable for the $200,000 note that was taken out. We're debiting interest expense for the um, interest expense. Remember, it was 10% 10, 10 annual interest, but it was only a three-month note, so three out of 12 months. Um, because, of course, 10% interest would be uh, 20000 right? And so we only want to take a quarter of that, basically, and then crediting cash for the 205000 all right, so you know a couple things with the the presentation of receivables, whether it's counts receivable, notes receivable. You know, again, we have to um, segregate the different types. So whether they are short term, uh, current assets, or long term assets, um, we have to appropriate uh, appropriately value the assets. Um, so you know, counts receivable, we want to list you know less allowance for doubtful accounts, uh, for example. Um, we want to disclose any loss contingencies that, that exist on the receivables. This is like that bad debt expense, that allowance for doubtful accounts, um, the allowance for uh, sales returns and allowances if, if we use that account. Um, we have to disclose if any of our receivables are designated or pledged as collateral in a loan or in a, a note, for example. Um, and then we have to disclose any credit risk um, inherent in the receivable. So if, um, like we do with our aging schedule, for example, if um, we expect, you know, our older accounts are gonna be less likely to be collectible, you know, again, that's, that's how we show, we show that in that allowance for doubtful accounts, right? All right, so lastly, um, speaking of cash and, and cash controls, we have to briefly talk about bank reconciliation. Um, and so when we're thinking about cash controls, and, and we talk about this a lot more in um, auditing when we get into auditing, but we think about, you know, the ARC is what protects us, right? So the ARC is the authorization, the recording, and the custody. And so these three functions should be done um, by separate individuals or, or separate um, entity because because it doesn't necessarily have to be an individual. One of them could be a bank, right? So, um, you know, authorization, recording and custody um, should happen. We should have a separation of duties there, right? Um, and so to to establish proper controls, again, is to prevent any unauthorized transactions and then to provide information necessary to manage um, cash on hand and cash transactions. And so using bank accounts, um, you know, again, um, to maintain that separation of duties and to help in the internal control process of cash, 
Um, we can use a uh, checking account. We have to consider uh, sometimes a collection float, lock box accounts or impressed bank accounts. And so at the company I worked for before starting to teach full time, um, we used a lock box. And so what happened is our customers mailed their payment right to the bank and the bank you know basically processed the check and put the money in our account and then sent us a copy of the invoice and the stuff attached to it um so when i say you know that i i i would get excited by collecting a big envelope the the big envelope of payments would actually be photocopies of the information that the bank sends us because again um, when we gave our customers an invoice, the mail your payment to address was to a lockbox at our bank. And so, and it was through Commerce Bank, for those of you that have heard of Commerce before, but, but basically the customers would mail their check to that lockbox, usually with a copy of the invoice or at least, you know, on the check, it would say the invoice number, whatever. And so the bank would make photocopies of that and send it to us. Um, so then that was one way that we were able to control um, these transactions, right? By using that, um, that lockbox account. Impress bank accounts are like where we use a separate bank account for payroll, for example. So, um, you know, if our payroll, and, and just to use an even number, let's say our payroll is $10,000 a month. So, you know, every month we're gonna put you know, $10,000 in our impressed bank account. And so once all of the payroll has been distributed, that account should be at a zero balance, right? And that's one way that we can control, you know, which, which checks have been cashed and to make sure that no checks are cashed two times, for example, or reduce the likelihood of fraud in that account, right? All right, so physical protection of cash balances, minimize cash on hand, um, only have a small amount of petty cash and current days receipts. We shouldn't have multiple days of cash receipts. Um, you know, we should try to deposit our cash receipts uh, as quickly as possible in the bank. We don't necessarily want piles of cash sitting around, right? So transmit each day's receipts into the bank as soon as practicable. Uh, practicable. Um, keep any cash funds in a vault saved or a locked cash drawer, and then periodically reconcile the balance um, in the cash account to the general ledger. And so again, some of those things we have to keep in mind um, when we reconcile our, our uh, bank balance to our ledger balance is that there could be deposits in transit. There could be outstanding checks. There could be bank charges and credits. There could be bank or depositor errors. So those are all things that we might have to contend with um, when doing bank reconciliation. Again, for those of you that had me for principles of accounting, we got a lot of practice with this, but um, for those of you that did not have me for principles, I don't know. I'd like to ask you how much how much practice you got with this. Um, but but nonetheless, we're going to at least do a couple few of these together, hopefully, and um, and get some more practice with it. Here's kind of that basic format um, for bank reconciliation. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to get this corrected cash balance, and this is our balance per the bank statement. So we're trying to get our balance per the bank statement once we make adjustments to it here to equal the corrected cash balance from the ledger account or from the depositors ledger books. Um, so, you know, I don't know if we say our bank is Commerce Bank and say our accounting software is QuickBooks, you know, you know, with bank reconciliation, we want to get our bank statement amount and once we make adjustments to that that bank statement from commerce to match our bank what it says we have in our cash account through our quickbooks software right so we're trying to reconcile the bank account with our accounting software our ledger account 
And so again, we see some of those things and what we have to do with them. If we have deposits in transit, we've got to add those back into the bank account. If we have undeposited cash receipts, we have to add those into the bank uh, balance. If we have bank errors that understate the bank statement balance, we have to add that in. If we have outstanding checks, we have to deduct those. If we have bank errors that overstate the bank statement balance, we have to deduct those. Um, if we had any bank credits or collections not recorded in the books, we have to add those to the ledger. If we have bank errors that understate the book balance, we have to add those to the ledger. If we have bank charges not yet recorded in the books, we have to deduct those from the ledger. If we have bank errors that overstate the book balance, again, we have to deduct those from the ledger. So a couple of those common things that we have to do. Um, this example shows you um, this company, Nugget Mining Company's books show a cash balance for November 30th of $20,502. The bank statement shows a balance of 22,190. Again, we wanna make adjustments to each of these until we get them to equal, basically. And I'm not gonna read through every single one of these. Um, you guys can read through these and, and look at the examples on the PowerPoint. I'm not, oh, there we go. Okay, I was gonna say, I'm not sure why this blank slide is in there, but... Um, so if we go back, you know, again, they're showing you each one of these and, and how they're handled. So I don't know how this blank slide got in here, but let's just look at number one, for example, uh, 3,680. So if we go back here to number one, a deposit of 3,680 that Nugget mailed November 30th does not appear on the bank statement. So if we mailed the, the deposit, we would have already recorded it in our accounting software. We, we, we would have already recorded it in our QuickBooks ledger account, but it wouldn't be recorded in the bank yet. So again, we'd have to add that deposit in transit. Um, if we look here, uh, number two, outstanding checks, number two, $5,001. Again, we go back here to number two. Checks written in November, but not charged to the November bank statement are check number 7327 for 150, check number such and such for 4820, check number such and such for $31. Apparently, if we add these three together, 150 plus 4820 plus 31, $5,001. So we wrote those checks, we've processed those checks already. We've already subtracted those checks from our QuickBooks ledger account, but they have not been subtracted from our bank account yet. They're, they're um, outstanding. So then you see we subtract those outstanding checks. So anyway, like I said, I'm not going to read through every one of these. You guys can go back and forth and look at the examples um, if, if you need to remind yourselves how those work. And then when we make adjusting entries, um, for these, it you know, it just depends on on what adjustments that we have to do uh, to the bank statement. But um, this is an example of what a, one of those adjusting entries might look like. Um, that you know, if we had cash collection that we had to record, we debit cash. If we incurred an additional expense, we debit the expense. If we're still owed more, we're we're debiting accounts receivable. Um, if we have to pay a fee or something, uh, liability we've incurred, we're crediting accounts payable. And if we have earned any interest revenue, we're crediting interest revenue, right? So it just depends on, um, on what changes need to be made or what adjustments are made rather to, um, to reconcile the, the bank, right? All right, here's some of the exercises that I had picked out. Um, I know we're not probably gonna be able to get to all of these, but hopefully we'll be able to get to the majority of them. Looking forward to that. Hopefully you guys are too. Um, let me stop sharing this. Hi guys. <laughs> I don't know how long that recorded lecture was, but it felt like a really long time. All right, so hopefully that helped you um, understand chapter seven. And again, when we get back into class, we'll get some practice with this. Bye guys, I'll see you soon.